Hi, it's Randy Herman with Keller Williams Realty bringing you everything real estate. And today we're talking about a great investment vehicle called a 1031 Exchange. And I have with me today the expert of experts, John Starling. John, thank you so much for coming. My pleasure to be here. Really appreciate it. Could you just tell us a little bit about where you work and how your company is set up? Yes, um, Northern Bank and Trust is a regional bank in New England and they recruited me about three years ago to start a 1031 exchange division because they were lending in real estate and development and they thought that it would be a great opportunity to service their clientele by offering 1031 exchanges. So did you have experience before? With I company? did. I came to um, Northern about three years ago um, to, to help them start their 1031 division, but I've been actively involved in um, 1031 exchanges since 2003. Oh, okay. Yeah. And have you done that on a personal level or mainly professional? I have. Done, I started on a personal level. In order to get into the business, I needed the 1031 an office building that I owned. Huh. And um, I decided it was just a, a great vehicle to help people preserve their profits and build their wealth. And so I decided to get into it. I had a law practice that I was involved in for about 18 years with my nephew. And we um, started a little 1031 division of the law practice. When I retired from that, I decided to take the 1031 business with me. Right. So you have a law degree as well? No, I am. Uh, I was the administrator of a law firm. Oh, I see. Great. Okay, yeah. terrific. Yeah. Well, it sounds like you have a lot of experience, so maybe we can just jump in. You can tell us what is a 1031 exchange. Absolutely. So 1031 exchange is a code. It's a code, a, a revenue code with the IRS, and it allows people to um, not pay tax on the profit that they receive from the sale of an investment property. Not pay tax at all or defer the taxes? Or? Not pay the tax at all when they sell their property and they reinvest the money into another property. Now what they have to do is they have to reinvest all the cash that comes from the sale of the relinquished property right. and they have to buy equal or greater in value okay. in order not to have any tax. Now when they sell the replacement property, mm -hmm. if they don't reinvest again, then the tax would come due at that time. I see. Um, so. Tell me, what kind of taxes does it defer? Well, the capital gains tax. Now, in the state of Mass, you have a state tax of 5.2% on capital gains, right. plus the federal capital gains tax is 15% for those of us that are not in the highest income bracket. And if you are in the highest income bracket, mm -hmm. you would have to pay 20% income uh, tax on capital gains. Now. There is an, also another tax called uh, the NIIT or net investment income tax, which is 3.8%. And that's include, that has to be included when you sell property. And then you've got a fourth tax, which is the re recapture of depreciation. Oh, which that is, tax, man. Yeah, 25% <laughs> on right. recapture of depreciation. Okay. So uh, does that all, all those taxes get deferred? All those taxes get deferred if you d do a 1031 exchange. In other Excellent. words, if you are exchanging your property for another property of equal or greater value. Okay. Mm -hmm. And maybe you can tell us then, uh, what are the rules that uh, you know 1031 goes? You, you mentioned a couple of them already, a like property. What, what is it you have to exchange one property for another like property? What does that mean? Well, like kind was, was um, instituted in the code because at the time when the code was uh, promulgated by the Internal Revenue Service, you could also exchange personal property. So like kind means you have to buy real estate for real estate. You can't buy a, you can't invest in a truck or a, or a, a oh, I see. motor vehicle or a right. boat or a airplane. You have to go like kind. So, so real it's estate only for, for real estate. estate. Okay, yeah. excellent. Now, at this time, personal property is no longer included in the opportunity to defer your taxes. Okay. So when you, when you sell real estate, you have to buy real estate. Now, any kind of real estate is like kind of any other kind of real estate. Oh, so I could buy a commercial um, building, let's say, and instead uh, switch it out for or exchange it for um, a, a number of apartments or A houses. residential triple-decker or a... 
or a duplex or or a uh, office okay. condo. Or so, when you say that, can I live in the property? No. Now. Um, you could live in the property that you buy as your replacement property, but only after you've held it as a rental for at least two years. Okay. Yeah. And do you have to hold the properties? Can I have a 1031 exchange after I've owned the property for three months? Yes. If you buy a property with the intent, and it all goes back to intent. So if you buy a property with the intent of holding it for long-term investment, mm -hmm. and then someone comes along and offers you a nice profit, then you should have the right to take that profit and, and move on. So the IRS allows you, there's no bright red line date of how long you have to hold a property before it's right. eligible for 1031 exchange. Right. But for, let's say, capital gains, you have to hold the property for a year. Exactly. Right. So if you do it in less than a year, are the taxes going to be that much higher? Or are they going to... No, okay? because if you're doing a 1031, there's no tax. Right. I the see. tax is deferred. And the tax would never be paid as long as you kept the money in real estate. Okay. It's only when you get out of real estate that you would then have to pay the tax. Mm -hmm. So what happens if I um, choose some properties, I find a great property, I want to do a 1031 exchange, but the property is actually less value than the original property? Okay, so then you have two alternatives. You can buy the, the, the original property that you sold, your relinquished property, um, was valued at, let's take an example, say 300000 And you find a replacement that you would like to buy for 270000 Right. So now there's a $30,000 difference, so you're buying down in value. You would have to pay the tax on the difference between the sales price of the relinquished property minus closing cost and the purchase price of the replacement property. Got it. So, so you might have to pay 30000 in. You might have to pay tax on 30000 Right. So, but you can do that. In other words, they you will can. let you do that. Yeah. Oh, that's great. If you buy equal or greater in value, right. then right. there would be no tax. So can I, let's say I buy a, a, a property and then I want to put the new exchange property in my <coughs> wife's name, let's say, is that allowed? Uh, after a certain period of time. So I I the same taxpayer has to to be vested on title in the replacement property okay. as owned the relinquished property. And how long do I have to do this exchange? Can I do? Can I wait a year? Can I do, how, do I have to do it immediately? So um, the the mechanics are that you would want, once you sell your relinquished property, and when I say sell, I'm talking about close. So when you've closed the property, then the proceeds go to a trust account that is controlled by the qualified intermediary, which would be my company. And then we would use those proceeds to buy a replacement property. Now we have to identify up to three potential replacement properties within 45 days. From That's the not date, much time in this market. Yeah, from the date of the yeah. closing. Yeah. So, uh, you know, what I've experienced as a realtor is that often a, um, somebody who wants to do a 1031 exchange will scout out some properties ahead of time and, and see which ones might be good fits for him and then do the exchange. Because right. you can sell so much quicker than you can find here. Well, you don't want to go shopping too early because properties that you're looking at today might not be here in 30 or 45 days. True. But I think it is time to start shopping once you have a contract to sell you the property you intend to relinquish. Now, you're not going to close once you receive that contract. You're not going to close immediately. It's probably going to be three to four to six weeks at before least, yeah. you close your relinquished property. Yeah. So you've got that three to six weeks time period to shop, right. plus an additional 45 days from the date of the closing. Right. So when you look at it from that perspective, you do have a sufficient time, generally, to find properties that you would be interested in putting a contract and, on. And worst case purchase. scenario is what happens if you don't find a property? Well, if you don't find one at the end of 45 days from the date of the closing of your relinquished property, if you haven't identified, then we have to transfer the money to you, the funds from the sale of your relinquished property, and then you'll ha end up having to pay the tax. Okay, great. Yeah. So maybe you could tell us just some of the different kinds of uh, 1031 exchanges there are, because you had mentioned something called a qualified intermediary, and so I'm sure that comes into play with certain kinds, right, of exchanges or with every exchange. Right, so the, the uh, original exchange process was for exchanging with someone else. So, it, and it was formed just several years after the tax code was initiated back in 
1921. The code was initiated in 1919, and two years later, the 1031 opportunity came into law in existence at that time. And someone now, told me that that's how the name came about, 1031 exchange, because it's the code in the tax system. That's right. Yeah. It's the code in the tax system. So, um, what you're going to what what you do is you, um, you you have to find someone when you do a true swap. You have to find someone that wants your property. Right. And you want their property. Right. Well, that's like hard finding to find. a needle in a haystack. Yeah. Right? Exactly. Yeah. So. Um, the IRS, over the course of the years, allowed a qualified intermediary to step in to be the person that, that swaps with the taxpayer. Oh, I see. So that's what the qualified intermediary does, right. is you contract with the qualified intermediary so that he can then actually, on paper, buy your property and sell it to the person you've already sold it to. I and see. then you find a replacement property. Right. And then the intermediary is assigned the contract so he can buy the property that you intend to buy to trade it with you or to swap it with you, to complete so, your swap. So the first type of 1031 is just an immediate exchange, right? Yeah, so yeah. the first kind is a swap. Right. So that would mean, and, and we, we hardly ever see those because it's hard to find yeah. you know, property that you want, that somebody has property that they want. So. Um, normally a qualified intermediary is, is involved in the transaction because you're selling your property to a third party right. and then you're buying a replacement property from a different pro a okay. person. And then the second is a, a delayed swap? In other well, words? That, is a de that would be a delayed swap unless you find one that you can close on immediately the same day mm -hmm. as you sell your relinquished property. So, uh, so we move forward. That's a forward called a forward delayed exchange. Okay. Now the next type of exchange would be a reverse exchange. So you could actually buy your replacement property before oh. you sell your relinquished. Okay. Now that goes to the to the issue that you brought up earlier. Right. What if you're in a hot real estate market? Which we are. And you can't find a replacement property within the 45 days. Well, you could start looking for the replacement property before you ever even put your property on the market. Okay. If you have the necessary credit or funds to purchase that property prior to the sale of your relinquished property, right. then you can do that. And the same rules Does it apply. have to be cash that you buy with? No, you could actually finance Mortgage it. it. Okay. Yeah. yeah. You know, you could put down, but you would have to put down a down payment, right. probably. True. And then you, or you could pay cash for it, right. and then you would buy it. Now you would have 180 days to sell your property and close on it. So you do have a time restriction on both sides. If you're doing a forward exchange, you have 180 days to buy your replacement property. If you're doing a reverse exchange, you have 180 days to sell your relinquished property. Yep, I got it. Okay, now there's also an improvement exchange. And what is an, that? An improvement exchange is kind of what it's, what it's saying. If you want to improve a property with your profits from your sale of your relinquished property. Okay. So you find a fixer-upper. Right. Let's say you sold your relinquished for 300 you find a replacement property for 200 but it needs $100,000 worth of work on it. Right. So now you need to... Like a construction loan, they would call it, if you were doing just a normal purchase. If you were doing just a normal purchase. Yeah. But you've got your 300000 from the sale of your relinquished property, so you're going to spend two to buy it, and then you're going to dole out the other 100 to contractors as they do the work. Well, that money can't come through you. It's got to come from me directly to the contractors because I will own an LLC that we set up specifically to own that property while it's under construction. We'll own it. Can, can I ask you something? It sounds yeah. so convoluted, yeah. this whole system with this qualified intermediary. How come they set it up that way? Well, the, the IRS originally only intended for swaps, for, for properties that were being swapped between right. two Mine individuals. Mine for yours or yours, yours for mine. Right. right. Um, over the course of the years, investors right. and attorneys right. kept hounding Congress and, and the IRS to allow swaps where you couldn't, when you couldn't find a replacement property that you wanted to buy that was owned by the same party that you were buying from. Right. So, you know, it evolved and the IRS loosened their regulations so that they would allow a intermediary to 
handle the transaction for you. Right. The keys there are that you can't touch the money All right. and that you have to buy your replacement property within a limited amount of time. I understand that. Okay, makes sense. Yeah. yeah thanks. Um, so what are the, the, the steps really that if you just run through, um, kind of summarize again the steps for doing a 1031 exchange? Well, okay, so you're an investor, you have a property you're thinking about selling. Right. You call up your, you call me up and you say, John, I'm interested in an exchange. I tell you about the process, I go over the paperwork with you, and then you put it on the market and you sign an exchange agreement with me, which is a contract with me to allow me to intercede into the process so that I can buy and sell your property. And then when you pick out your replacement property, we can handle the transaction the same way. Oh, so you're actually doing the actual transactions. We're, we, the uh, contracts are assigned to us so that oh, I see. It, it flows through us. Now, the IRS allows for direct deeding. So the buyer and the seller don't really have to use the qualified intermediary to deed the property to and then have it deeded out from the intermediary to the, to the other individual. I see. So you're really controlling the money. Since controlling the money yeah. and the assignment of the contracts. Right. So um, once the, once the um, property sells, then there's a contract. Then that contract between my exchangeor, the person who's relinquishing his property, and the, buy, the seller, the buyer of his property, that contract gets assigned to the intermediary, which would be me. Yeah. Okay, so the closing attorney then sets up the settlement statement based on instructions that I send him on how to, how to prepare the settlement statement a little bit differently than a standard settlement statement because the money is coming to the qualified intermediary and the seller becomes the qualified intermediary as the intermediary for the exchangeor. So the settlement statement has to be set up properly. I sign the settlement statement along with you as the exchangeor. And then we do the same thing in reverse when you buy your replacement property. So, and th then those settlement statements along with your ID form uh, get put in a package that we prepare to send to your IRS, to your CPA to prepare your IRS return. I see. Yeah. And, well, it, sound, it does sound uh, a bit convoluted it, just because I'm a realtor and we do so many transactions. I have done 1031 exchanges with my clients and they found it so beneficial and we get calls all the time. Oh, I have to do, I have to find property. I have a 1031 exchange in, in process here. Sure. Yeah. So um, it does sound though like you are very meticulous about how you um, look at each of these transactions and control the money. Absolutely. And, which brings me to my question is to how do you find a qualified um, intermediary like yourself? Well, um, you want to be careful in that you want to ask questions. Um, the qualified intermediary is going to be holding your money, so you want to make sure that your money is secure. Um, one of the advantages of using Northern 1031 Exchange is that Northern 1031 is owned by Northern Bank and Trust, and so Northern 1031 has to operate under the same banking regulations as the bank does, protecting your money so that your money is insured and, and protected under the banking regulations of the, of the, of the, uh, of the uh, federal government and the state government. Now, a qualified intermediary that is not associated with a bank doesn't have to operate under those under those standards. Not that there aren't uh, qualified intermediaries that are certainly um, re respectable and and your money is very secure. There are, but you don't want to go on the internet and just select someone from California to handle your money for you. Right. So, do you have to be licensed in every state to do this? You do not. Really. That's correct. There is no licensing division in the state of Massachusetts for qualified intermediaries. Wow. So how do you do then get qualified? Well, uh, y you get qualified only by your experience with the IRS. And the IRS does not have a qualification process that a person has to go through in order to be a 
a qualified intermediary. That's why it's very important for you to understand who your qualified intermediary is and how your money is protected. Wow. So it's, it's vitally important because it sounds like almost anybody can hang out a shingle if they Any, wanted to. That, that's correct. Wow. Yeah, anybody could hang out a shingle. Now, the problem is that they accept a lot of responsibility and liability when they accept your money. Right. You know, it's against the law to steal people's money. So, <laughs> I mean, right. you could go to jail, you know, and freedom is very important to me, and I'm sure it is to you as well. Right, absolutely. But, um, but that doesn't mean that there aren't um, shysters in the world, and, of course, we, we have to be careful of, of, of people that are crim have criminal intent. Right. So, uh, tell me, how, how many... 1031 exchanges do you do in a year? Well, uh, probably about 250 now. Wow. Um, and we... Um, this we, is your company? Well... Northern Bank. Northern Bank is, is, is um, the parent company of Northern 1031 Exchange. Right. So Northern 1031 Exchange does 250 exchanges? Um, somewhere close to that. Um, we, I have another company that I... Uh, manage also that I own that um, does exchanges in the southeast. You can tell I'm not from Boston. Great from accent, accent, I have to say. Great Thank accent. You. And um, I love this area though. And when I was recruited by the bank to set up their 1031 exchange division, I had my own uh, practice in the North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, Florida area. So between the two, you do 250? So I do about 250 between the two organizations. Wow. Can yeah. you give us an example of uh, a recent one that saved someone a lot of money or a situation that really helped them out? Sure. I'll give you one um, that I've used in a presentation earlier today because it's on the top of my mind. Okay. We, um, we helped a lady that owned a, uh, a condo in the Cambridge area. And she paid three hundred thousand for it. Mm -hmm. She um, sold it for one point three million. Sounds common in this day and age. Yeah. Yeah. So she had a great gain. She had a, a million dollar gain. Right. Well, the taxes on a million dollar gain for her were going to be about three hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Right. Okay. So rather than pay three hundred and fifty thousand. So this tax, wasn't. Let me. I just interrupt yeah, you for ahead. a second. This was an investment property, or her her. Primary residence. Okay, so um, we combined on this one because it was her inv it was her primary residence at one point. Right. She moved at she bought it about six years ago. She moved in it and lived in it for three and a half or four years, right. and then she moved to London. Right. Now she put a tenant in the property. Right. So for two years she had a tenant in the property okay. that classified it as an investment property, oh. even though it had been her primary residence before. Right. You probably have a lot of people that buy a yep. residence, they outgrow it, they buy another residence, but they don't sell that one and they put it in it, they, they keep it as a tenement. Exactly. Or a yeah. rental property. Very common. Okay, very common. So that's what she did. She moved out of the condo because she had to go to London for business purposes. Mm -hmm. She lived in London for a couple of years. She had lived in it for two out of the last five, so she was eligible for 121. You know what the 121 code is? Yeah, that's a deduction for your primary residence at the correct. So if you're here. single, you can you can make a profit of two hundred and fifty thousand dollars on your primary residence without paying any tax. If you're married, you can make up to five hundred thousand on your primary residence as long right. as you've owned it for two years right. before you sell it. Now, if you've owned it for five if you've owned it for five years and you have lived in it for at least two out of the last five, right. and you've rented it for at least two, right. then you're eligible to do a combination 1031 exchange and 121 tax code exemption. So what, she w what happened with my case, my, my lady, she, bought, she uh, was able to take 250000 in profit off the table, and she kept that money, and then the other 750000 in profit she used to buy replacement properties. Wow. Is there a, a limit as to the amount of profit that you can exchange or tax, you know, the taxes that you can exchange? I mean, do they put a cap on it at all? No, no cap. Wow. That's, that's fantastic. And we do exchanges for large corporations as well as single individuals. You know, I do exchanges for as little as $150,000, $200,000. You know, when they're selling their relinquished property for that small right. of an amount. Right. Because, I mean, if you're making $50,000 in profit, 
you're going to pay about 30%, so 3 times 5 would be about 15000 I charge you $1,800 to do the exchange, and we take all the worry out of it for you. So You uh, find a buyer, right, you, you go to a seller, and you know, we handle all the paperwork. Right. Do you charge based upon the size of the exchange, or is it a flat fee? It's a flat fee until you get up above $5 million, and then it goes up to 2500 above 10 million it goes up to about 3500 and then above that call for a quote right and <laughs> <laughs> is is it um, like a mandated fee or is it something you can set whatever fee you want to no, set no that's that's the fee that we set based on the amount of time and effort and paperwork that's involved in it. Right. Now that's for a forward exchange. A reverse exchange and an improvement exchange are quite a bit more because they're much more complicated yeah. and they require the formation of an entity, a separate entity, to hold title. And that entity has to actually take title to the property that's being um, reversed. Right. Well, this is very improved. illuminating and you explain it so clearly, so well, I, we you. really appreciate it. My, uh, We do have a couple minutes left, literally. Um, I'm just wondering, do you have another example of something that uh, a 1031 exchange that helps people um, in terms of a, I mean, I've heard about a case, for example, where um, a, another woman had a house that was in bad condition and she moved and changed it 1031 exchange for several houses that were in much better condition that cost less money, but she could rent for actually more. So she made out all the way around. Yeah, absolutely. That's yeah. a great example of how you can diversify. You know, some people do, I mean, you do exchanges for lots of different reasons. Um, sometimes people want to move into a better area to maybe get more rent, um, better management area, um, uh, w closer to home where they can look after it more. Right. Sometimes they want to diversify. They're selling one property that's, that they've sold for a lot of money and they want to buy two or three rentals so that right. they can diversify. They may want to consolidate. They may have a headache with you know, owning five rental properties. They're just tired of all the, you know, the necessary things to look after those five properties. And so they want to sell all five of them and buy one big commercial piece. Right. You know. I, I, let me just ask you one thing. You had mentioned uh, um, a recapture of depreciation. Sure. Can you explain that to us? Yeah. Um, basically, when you buy an investment property, you are allowed to depreciate it because if it's an improved property, in other words, it has a building on it. Usually it's over 30 years, 25, 30 years. Tw on a residential, 27 and a half years. On a commercial, like 39 years. So, so you get to write off the value of the improvement on the property over the course of years, and you can write that off against the income that you receive during that year. So depreciation is a very valuable tool for investors because if you rent a place, let's take an example, you rent a place out and you get um, $25,000 a year for it. Mm -hmm. So then you are depreciating $15,000 a year, so now your net is only $10,000 of income that you have to pay tax on. You're really getting $25,000 worth of income, but because you are depreciating your building, you can deduct 15 of that on the, for depreciation, and so you're only paying tax on 10000 and you do that each year. Right, and then they recapture part of it. So then when you sell, right. you haven't paid tax on that money, right. and so then it has to be recaptured, and it gets recaptured at a little higher rate at 25%. Right. I see. John, thank you so much. This has been so instructive. Um, if people have questions, how can they get in touch with you? Well, the, the best way would be to call my cell phone, which is 910-616-1991. Uh, if you can't remember that, though, you can call uh, the, the bank, Northern Bank and Trust, and ask for the 1031 division. My associate, Michelle Fitzpatrick, is there on a daily basis, and she'll be happy to help and steer you have any questions, answer any questions that you have. Well, thank you so much. This has been so instructive, and definitely I'll be giving you a call because I have clients okay. who can use your services. Well, thank so. you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. Yep, thanks. Okay.